Are you tired of making the same trading mistakes over and over again? Have you ever seen a professional trader and just asked yourself, how the hell did this person get to this point? I get it. It's easy to ascribe luck or circumstance to someone being where you want to be. But most profitable traders started out just like you, lost, confused, and some of them probably almost gave up trading at some point. If you want to hear the story of someone who went through that exact same process, listen up. Because the other day I hosted a live call where I talked about my journey as a trader, the bad habits that I had developed in my early years, how I overcame them, and then how others can, can follow this process to overcome them themselves. And guess what? Today I'm releasing it for the first time to the public. So I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think in the comments. Did I hit the mark? Does any of this resonate with you? Let me know. Okay. That you do, um, in fact, mute yourself back. Okay. Second of all, if you want, you can turn your cameras on. It makes it a bit more personal, right? A bit more like of a connection. I'm not like talking to a blank screensaver, right? Like kind of, kind of commits a, a bit more of a connection there. And, you know, if you don't want to stare at me, you can stare at some other people, some of your other uh, fellow attendees instead of looking at me, right? So uh, that could be a little bit better. Uh, third of all, my co-host Alex is going to be moderating this. So oh, there he is a beautiful face. Uh, he's going to be moderating this. He's my co-host and he's my business partner. And he's going to be taking all of your questions in the chat. So if you have any good questions, he's going to send them to me. And I'm going to, you know, throughout the presentation, probably go through some of them. So just throw your questions in the chat. Alex is going to be moderating. And yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. So the path. This sounds mysterious, right? Um, but essentially what this shows you is just essentially the path that everyone takes when you're trying to master anything, whether that's trading, whether that's you know becoming a doctor or whether that's an e-com brand. You always start on the left side and you make your way incrementally towards the right, okay? I'm sure some of you might be on the left side of the chart here, on the new side, completely new to the crypto markets or to the trading markets, and you're slowly dipping your toes in it. Or maybe you you identify more with the intermediate person, the person who is, you know, you've, you've experienced a little bit of the market, but you haven't quite found consistency yet. So you, you know, you have a trading strategy, but you're not quite there yet, right? You're not quite to the right side of the graph. I suspect the majority of the people in here are on that side, right? You're on the left side of the graph or you're on the intermediate side. The third side, this is the professional trader. So this is someone who has become profitable, okay? And whatever that means, right? What does that mean to be profitable? It doesn't necessarily mean just to be able to live off of trading. It means that instead of giving away your money to the market, you're actually bringing some in, whether that's for your nest egg, whether that's for an extra few dollars for groceries, or that's for, um, you know, to be actually a professional trader and to live off that, Right. I get that not everybody wants to be driving around in Bugattis and driving around uh, iced out and stuff like that. Some people just want a little bit of extra money to be able to afford groceries or a little bit of extra money to save for their kid's college fund, whatever it is, right? That's kind of where I am. I'm on that pro side, but I don't care about things like that, like driving around Bugattis and stuff. What I'm doing this for is to spend more time with my family and to be able to do the things that I love, Okay. So who am I? Well, let's start with the regular stuff. Uh, I'm a Canadian. You might have been able to tell by my accent. Uh, I'm a dog owner. Uh, I have a bachelor's of commerce and I have my Canadian securities course or in my license. That does not mean that I can be a security guard. What that means is that I am licensed and regulated to sell securities, so stocks. Uh, and I have essentially all the accreditation to be a financial advisor. Okay. Something that might be jumping out at you there is the fact that I built a, or co-built a million dollar training community. What does that mean? Well, essentially in a past life, I worked with a pretty big YouTuber who will rename, remain nameless um, to build out his training community, okay? He essentially, I took a course of his, um, joined his team, and then helped him build that up to the empire that it is today. Eventually, I ended up leaving that community to start my own community, which is Income Mastery, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Okay. So 
I'm not going to get into who the YouTuber is or what the community is, but you guys all know my name by now, Lex Brazo. You can Google it and find out pretty quickly. I'm in a few of the YouTube videos. So we'll get into that in a second. So you might be asking, what is Inca Mastery? That would be a very good question. Essentially, Inca Mastery is the brainchild of Alex and I, my co-host, um, where we want to teach people high earning skills, okay? So that people can live life on their own terms and not necessarily be trapped either behind a desk or trapped uh, living life for their boss, right? Like a lot of us want to live autonomously or at least want to be able to bring in a little bit of funds so that we're not trapped uh, and like slaves to our paycheck, right? You want to be bulletproof in your income. And that's what Income Mastery is about. It's about developing high earning skills in different aspects of your life so that if one goes away, you still have more uh, income coming in, other side incomes, okay? That's what Income Mastery is about. I want to start with a story of someone who came over the other day to fix my my dryer, like my, my clothes dryer, okay? This person was an immigrant from a undisclosed uh, Middle Eastern country. Okay, I don't wanna say exactly where, I might get a little political. Um, but anyways, he came to Canada with nothing but a few dollars. Uh, he had just enough to live for a few months uh, and he was able to make it work. He has a thriving business right now he has a big house and he was able to bring the rest of his family and his extended family over here to Canada. Okay. You might be asking, well, how, how does someone do that with nothing to their name, nothing in their pocket skills, your government can take whatever they want from you. They can take all of your possessions, your, your money, your company, your passport, whatever it is. Right. But they can't take the skills that you learn from you. Those are things that are yours and yours alone. And, you know, if you can develop skills that are in demand anywhere in the world, then you can work anywhere in the world. You are not tied to that specific place. Okay. And that's what income master is about. I have mastered the skills of trading. Alex has mastered the skills of e-com and we're able to bulletproof our income from anywhere in the world. Okay. That's what our purpose is here with Income Mastery, to build high income skills in different aspects of life. So let's move on from this and get into the real reason that you guys are here, learning how to be more consistent as traders. We're going to start with how I got into the market. Okay. And with this, I'm sure like most people's uh, stories, there, there's lots of highs and lows because it's not linear. Nothing is usually linear when you're trying to master a skill. So how did I get into the market? Well, my interest was peaked pretty young. Uh, I think I had a lot of influence from my brother who was uh, going into finance. And when I went to the university, I went in commerce and my expectation was that I'm going to go to school. I'm going to ace all my classes. I'm going to become an investment banker and be a billionaire. Okay. That's what I was hoping for. Uh, the reality of being a student athlete kind of kicked in where I had uh, two a day practices, 5 a.m. lifts, 6 a.m. runs, um, and a full class schedule. That really, you know, kind of put a bolt in those plans. Um, but regardless, you know, all of that being fully financed by student debt and not scholarships like, you know, in the United States where there, there's a lot more money to hand out. Uh, I think Alex can can probably attest to that. He was also a student athlete. Regardless, in university, I had a class that was related to investments and we had a sim trading assignment. So we had to simulate trade, build a long-term portfolio uh, and a short-term investment strategy. Okay, killed that class, mainly because I was over leveraged in Tesla and you know high energy stocks where back then, you know, you put a dollar in Tesla, you get a thousand dollars back. Uh, so that really cemented my love for the markets and trading. 
And then also cemented the fact that I love high risk trading, which is one of the reasons why I mainly trade crypto. I do trade others, but mainly crypto. Okay. So eventually I left university with a lot of student debt uh, and was able to somehow scrape together about a thousand dollars. And I invested that into the stock market. Probably not the best financial decision for someone who is loaded with student debt is to gamble your money in the stock market. But that ended up being a candid event in my life because I ended up doubling my money within a few months. Okay. That was huge for me, huge for someone who was just in crazy student debt, crazy credit card debt, living paycheck to paycheck. I'm sure that would be a lot of money for anyone in here, right? Like do a reaction or, or write something in the chat if you could use an extra thousand dollars, right? If you can use an extra thousand dollars weekly, monthly, whether that's to pay for rent, whether that's to pay for groceries, that is huge, right? So that can an event in my life really cemented the fact that this could be done for a living, not just here and there to, you know, pay for a new pair of shoes or something like that, something that you could sustainably live off of. And that's where I looked for a way to sustainably do this. And that's where I found the community that I was in. Here's the thing. The growth, like I said, wasn't linear. Anyone's growth journey looks from, you know, when you're looking back on it, it looks like a movie trailer or a training montage in Rocky where the first 30 seconds is struggle. And then the next two and a half minutes is, you know, he's winning the championship. He's a professional boxer, whatever, right? What people don't realize is that that first 30 seconds is months, years. It's much longer than most, most people anticipate, right? So it's not linear, the growth. It's ups and downs, ups and downs until it's parabolic. It, become, it becomes much more linear if you know about the pitfalls in the industry, which I did not, which I did not learn from my previous mentor. Okay. So the pitfalls, let's get into that. Okay. A little bit parched. Give me a second. Before we get into that, let's see if there's any questions in the chat. Yeah. hundred percent. Someone's here's new to the Forex market for sure. Yeah, a thousand dollars would definitely make a difference. One thousand percent. That's huge money there. Hundred percent, it is. Hundred percent, it is. Even if it's not a thousand dollars, even if it's doubling fifty dollars, even if it's doubling a hundred dollars, that's huge. And that's scalable. That's scalable to whatever, whatever amount of income you have. Okay. Okay. So, let's get into it. The early days, the bad habits, how these pitfalls manifested themselves. Well, I would say that the biggest pitfall of my trading career was the fact that I had a lot of my success being built in the built in the bull market. When everything is perpetually going up and you know, stocks are going up, crypto's going up, commodities are going up, everything's going up, every it's almost impossible to lose money, right? Unless you're trying. Um, everybody seems like a genius when they're in the bull market. That's just the way it is. It's not quite the same when the market turns and your strategies of buying and holding completely get tanked, right? When you no longer can just buy something and it's no matter what going to go up. Not quite as easy when the market flips. And I think a lot of traders have felt that over the last two to three years in this bear market that we've been in, right? So how did these manifest themselves? Well, they turned into bad habits, right? Or they revealed my bad habits, if anything. First thing, journaling. That was the biggest thing that was really revealed to me when I got kicked in the teeth by this bear market, okay? Early success meant that journaling was for others, but not me. I essentially felt like I was this natural trader. I was just this person who was just good at stuff like this. Like I was a student athlete. I was really good at video games. So I was like, hey, this is just another avenue. This is just something else that I'm good at, right? 
when the market turned and all of a sudden nothing that I was doing was working, that's when I noticed my journaling wasn't on par because I hadn't done it. Okay. I thought there was no point in self-reflection that consequences, the consequences of that really turned up in the bear market. Okay. And we're going to talk about that in a sec. The second thing, leverage. Leverage is the big boogeyman for people because they don't understand how to use it. But it's also a big boogeyman for people because even people who don't, who know how to use it correctly can succumb to their emotions and just lever up on a trade, go 200x leverage and lose all their money. I've done it before. Maybe some of you have done it before where you just crank up the leverage hoping for big gains and usually that ends in just big losses, right? Uh, I've done it before, okay? Don't, uh, if, if this is one of you, if you've done this before, don't feel ashamed. In a second, you're going to see one of my most shameful moments uh, of using leverage. So the next thing, system hopping. That was a big one for me that I had to break from, okay? And the main reason that I was doing this is because when the bear market reared its head, my strategies weren't working anymore. Nothing was working anymore. And there was no way for me to analyze what had worked in the past because I didn't have my journal. I didn't have anything. I didn't have any reference point to understand why something was working versus why something wasn't. And what that made was an inconsistency in plan. An inconsistency in my trading plan meant inconsistency in my results. That's just how it works. If you're jumping from thing to thing to thing, you don't have enough time or enough data to know if it works or not. And that was one of the things that I had to fix to become more profitable. The next thing, bad habits compound exponentially. One bad habit can make it make or break you and can make or break your system, but multiple bad habits are just a death sentence. You're never going to find profitability in the market. Unless you've gone through drawdown and you've gone through the experiences and the struggle of drawdown, it's hard to understand it and it's hard to manage it and get over it. A lot of people talk about trading psychology and say like, oh, all you need to do is read trading in the zone. I don't know if any of you have heard that or have read that. It's one of the most common trading psychology books. You can read that a million times a day. You can read that all damn day. That's not going to make a difference in your trading because you don't know how to implement it. You've never had those struggles before. So all of these bad habits compounded and ended in climax into one specific, culminated into one specific time in my life that is a vivid memory that is kind of shameful and I've never really talked about with people other than you know my, my premium community. I've blown up multiple accounts. I'm not scared to say that, but the, the way that I blew this one up is one that, that kind of touches, uh, hits kind of close to home. I was at my in-laws for the holidays, okay? And I was pretty down bad because, one sec. I was pretty down because I had essentially drained a lot of the profits and progress that I had made in the bull market because of the bear market. So I was so emotionally distraught that I literally went upstairs, went away from the party, went away from the whole family, sat on a bed alone and pulled up the one minute chart and was essentially gambling on the next one minute candle. I was going, uh, I think what they were allowing me to have at that time in terms of leverage was 200 X. I was going full leverage no stop loss, betting on the next candle. No stop loss, no take profit, betting on the next candle. If the next candle closed bullish, I close, get profits, close bearish, I lose. Think of, <laughs> put that in your mind and think of the, the vision. What does that look like? Someone who's sitting there looking at their phone very intently, having like a, a big family gathering happening downstairs while I'm sitting up there being a total degenerate, right? What do you think that that happened? What happened with that? I had no strategy. I had no plan. I blew up my account. 
obviously. I blew up what was left of my account. And then I had to go downstairs with the shame of what I just did. No one knew what happened. No one knew that I just did this very shameful thing. But yet I knew. And that was one of the biggest turning points in my trading. Pure self-destruction. That's all that was. And I'm telling you this because I'm not telling you this as a like boo-hoo for me story because this is one of my biggest turning points. I'm telling you this because I've been through the highs and lows of trading. Some of you might not have. Some of you sound like you're, you're relatively new to the trading markets, okay? I've been through the highs and lows. I've had high highs and very low lows. And until you go through that, it's very hard to understand. And because I almost gave up on trading then and there forever. Glad that I didn't. It ended up being a pretty big event in my life. But that was one of the turning points right there. So where did my turning, uh, where did my trading really turn around? Well, my trading really turned around when I met my new mentors. Okay. I still keep in touch with them now every day. It really turned around when I met people and started learning from people who had experience and profitability in different market environments and different markets. So not just trading crypto, not just trading Forex, not just trading stocks in the bull market, trading all of these different assets in different market conditions, bull market, bear market, totally different. That's what the key differentiation was. So how did I know that these mentors were the real deal? Well, they weren't trying to teach me a strategy. They weren't trying to feed me trades. They did have a strategy and they would post their trades, but they weren't trying to instill a rigid framework onto me, onto my trading. You see that a lot with trading groups or gurus. They say, you have to do it this way, this way, this way, and that's it. That is the only profitable way to trade. Then they're going to knock on other uh, crypto trading groups being like, oh, that's not how you do it, blah, blah, blah. How I knew these people were the real deal is that they taught me how to look at the market. Rather than teach me what to look at, they taught me how to look at it, right? They taught me the value of self-reflection and they led this by example, by showing you the way to journal trade, the way to look at the market and develops critical thinking skills. It's not, you're not going to be successful in a, in the markets. If you're, you just have this trading system that it's very rigid and you only do this, this, and this, if this opportunity presents itself, you need to be in flow with the market and you need to have a critical thinking mind. You need to have a critical thinking mind that can let the creative mind come out. And a lot of people don't encourage that in their trading. So here's the thing. Who is responsible for your learning and your profitability? Is it the person you bought a course from? Is it a Twitter trader uh, who you're finding signals from? No. It's you, right? There's no one who cares more about your success than you. And there's no one who's going to do more about it than you. Here's another anecdote. I'm, I'm chock full of anecdotes uh, in this presentation. I wasn't the only person who learned underneath my mentors. There were about 100 of us who joined during the same class as me. Of the 100 of us, there's only two of us who are doing our own thing and trading our own books and our own styles. Everyone else is still within that community because it, it was a community just like mine where he had live streams and blah, blah, blah. Everyone else is still in that community just hoping for a live stream, hoping to find some little crumb here and there uh, of a trade, of a semblance of a trade or an allocation. None of them took the self-responsibility of their trading onto themselves. They're projecting responsibility for their success onto other people. And that's why they're never going to get past that point. So what does this mean? 
how did I do this? How did I take self-responsibility? Well, the main thing was I started asking myself a question. Every time I took a trade and every time I took a trade that lost or I felt uneasy or I, you know, I, uh, I felt tilt in the market, I asked myself this simple question. How would a professional trader act in this exact situation? It's a pretty easy question. And a lot of times we know what we have to do, but we don't do it. Right? So let's say you got stopped out of a trade, but then the price reverted and hit to where your full profit would have been. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me a bunch of times, right? Doesn't that get your blood boiling? Doesn't that annoy you? Because you're like, I was right. I was right, but yet I missed it just because my stop loss was too tight or uh, I was greedy and I, I reduced risk too early, right? That happens to a lot of people. That happened to me. That's happened to me before. What about this situation? Price is coming down to your entry, doesn't quite hit your entry, and then goes up and hits your full profit. Well, that's annoying, right? A lot of people, the next time they would that situation would happen where price is coming right close to their entry, they would just mark the order in, ruining their, their risk reward, ruining the setup that they had to hopefully try to replicate what just happened. How would a professional trader act in that situation? Do you think they'd be ruled by their emotion and just jump into a trade? completely throwing off their risk reward, completely throwing their game plan out the window? Probably not, right? Probably not. So that's one of the things that you need to start thinking about is if I'm trying to become better at this thing, what do the people who are better at it do? And it's easy to say, it's easy to say that, right? Everybody says like, oh, just be better. But it's something you need to actively work on to become better at, okay? One of the areas that really benefited from me asking this question to myself was in my journal, on the topic of journal. Has this ever happened to you where you had a trade plan going into the day Price didn't do what you wanted it to do or what your game plan was saying, but you still got into a trade anyways. You got stopped out. Like it happens. Obviously, you're not following your trade plan. You get stopped out. Then you walk away from the chart and you don't journal that trade because you say to yourself, I was not following my trading plan. That means that I wouldn't do it in the future. So that trade doesn't count. I've done that before. I know a lot of people who have done that before. What would a professional trader do? Would they not journal that trade because it wasn't part of their trading plan? Or would they journal on the fact that they did do that, that they did make that mistake, figure out what led to that, what's what made them succumb to that impulse, that decision, and journal on it so that it never happens again? I'd assume that that's probably what the professional trader would do. So on the topic of journaling, I want to show you what my old journal looked like versus what my current journal looks like. Okay. Let's look at this. This is what my journal looks like now. It's pretty standard. Shows the asset that I'm trading. It shows the position, whether it's a long or a short. It shows the outcome. You know, it was a win, it was a full profit. The strategy, it shows the RR, the PL, and then notes, and then also screenshots of before and afters. Pretty standard stuff. Nothing groundbreaking here, right? This is what it used to look like. No, I didn't forget to put a picture on the slide. That's what my Turing Journal used to look like because I didn't track my trades, right? I told you this earlier. I didn't really track my trades. And what I did have, the semblance of a journal that I had was essentially just an Excel sheet with a few screenshots in it. 
no notes, no PL, no how was I thinking during this trade. Something else that's interesting, I think, from one of my old journals was that the majority of the screenshots in that journal were wins. And they were like posted after the win. But yet I was, still wasn't a profitable trader. Isn't it funny kind of how that happens? That we journal mostly our winning trades and we don't think about our losers. They stack up, right? So this brings me to what I call the three pillars of consistency. Risk management, psychology, and mindset and beliefs. Let's get into it. Risk management. I think this is a pretty big a pretty big issue in a lot of communities, and it's a misunderstood cornerstone of training, of trading, sorry. A lot of people use risk management as a buzzword. We're going to reduce risk on this trade. We're going to make sure you have good risk management. But what does that even mean? It's such a broad concept and it encompasses so many different aspects like your stop loss, like your the percentage that you're risking per trade. How, how risky the asset that you're trading is. There's so many different aspects to this that it's hard to, you know, we could have like a four hour discussion just on this, on risk management. But one of the things that I think benefited me the most as a trader, and one of the things I'm going to tell you, which is going to be a little bit controversial to some of you, the one aspect that I think benefited me the most was this. <laughs> and here's, here's the controversial opinion. I don't think that you should manage risk on your trades in the context of your stop loss, okay? Of your stop loss placement and risk reduction. Hear me out. This sounds like heresy. I get it. This, your, your pitchforks, your sharpening up your pitchforks. I get it. Okay. I'm going to give you an anecdote of why I think this. Okay. And why I, I, I live by this. One of my students one day asked me to review his trade log. Okay. And he asked me, well, I'm, I haven't been profitable this month, but I want to know if my system still has edge. I want to know if my system. There's something there, or should I just throw it out and move on to something new? I'm like, okay, well, let me go through this. And what I found, which was pretty interesting, was that he had a lot of trades in there that hadn't gone to full completion. They hadn't gone to either full profit or full loss. So I'm like, okay, makes sense, risk management. So then I went through his risk management. I saw small wins, small wins, small wins, big losses, big losses. Small wins. So like, okay, let me do a little bit of math. Let me figure out, see what he's doing, what's going wrong. What I figured out was that if he had never reduced risk on any of his trades that month, instead of being negative, he would have been up eight to 10 R, I believe. For anyone who doesn't know, like R means risk factor and an R multiple is what you're risking per trade. So let's say he was risking thousand dollars per trade he'd be up eight to ten thousand dollars on the month if he hadn't reduced risk on any of his trades interesting right here's the thing as traders we always focus on your take profit we focus on back testing where is the optimal take profit place where is the optimal stop loss placement what's the optimal amount i should risk per trade uh, things like that, but we never back test our risk management system. Many people don't back test that and it ends up killing them in the end because they assume that risk management is a safe way to trade when really you could be just killing all your gains. If you found through your back testing that you were three times more profitable if you took a trade and walked away, then you were, if you took a trade and stayed there and messed around and fiddled with it, would you have the discipline to walk away from your trade? It takes much more discipline to not mess around with your trade and not think about it than it does to mess around with it and to reduce your risk as soon as price goes up a little bit. 
because it feels safe and because it's been drilled into you. You read all these books about reducing risk and guaranteeing profits. Well, for him, he was guaranteeing losses. He was guaranteeing much bigger losses than bigger profits. And that's the thing. That's why I don't think that people should be reducing risk unless they have a profitable way of doing so. You might be just killing your gains. I'm not saying that if you have a good risk management strategy right now, that you shouldn't reduce risk on your trades. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you're going to reduce risk because it feels safe, what you need to do is make sure you're at least tracking in your journal what would happen if you didn't reduce risk. Maybe you'd be three times more profitable. Maybe you would be profitable, right? Maybe you wouldn't lose quite as much. You might have more uh, bigger losses in a row, but your winners are going to win big, right? So that's kind of my <laughs> controversial opinion on that. Let's move on to some psychology stuff. So this is another four-hour conversation here. If we were to talk about all the different aspects of psychology, and I don't even think four hours would be enough for that. But what I want to mainly talk about are the three main biases to overcome in your trading and that I had to overcome to become more consistent in my trading. The first one, confirmation bias. This is an interesting one because this is how it usually plays out, okay? You jump into a trade, you think price is going to go up. You jump into a trade, you get stopped out. But then in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm still right on this. So that first move was to flush out the weak hands. I'm not a weak hand. I'm going to get back into this and I'm going to ride this to the top. Then you start looking for all the different reasons that your trade is the right trade to take. This is going up no matter what. I see a 30 second smart money reversal double flag pennant on the chart. So I need to jump into this. I know that this is going up. Boom, you get stopped out again. Boom, you get stopped out again. Boom, you get stopped out again. That's confirmation bias. Anchoring bias. This is another interesting one because it manifests itself in ways that you probably don't perceive. Anchoring bias. Think of a new trading system or a new trading strategy. This is just an example. It can apply to a bunch of different things. Think of a new trading system or strategy that you got off YouTube, okay? You try it out. The first three trades are winners. Anchor that gets created in your mind is that now this is a profitable system. I'm going to get rich. The reality is that the next 10 trades lose and you're down, you're underwater because you don't have a good strategy. You rely too much on the initial data set, on the anchor, to be able to effectively weigh the decision of using that trading strategy, to effectively make a profitable decision. It's the same thing with the opposite. You could have tried a new strategy that lost three times in a row. So the anchor that gets created in your mind is, oh, this isn't a valuable strategy. This doesn't work. Reality is the next 10 trades would have been profitable and you would have been up. That's the issue with relying too heavily on the first data set because you can't objectively measure the effectiveness of the system. And that's what happens when people, when they're system hopping, they're relying on anchoring bias. The last one, availability heuristics. So this one sounds a little bit complicated, but essentially all this means is that you're relying too much on Twitter traders and random very easily accessible information in the markets to make your decisions. So you see, I don't know, you see someone on Twitter saying that price is going to go up because of Fibonacci, blah, blah, blah. Right? So you base your decision on that. Or even worse, you're using an indicator. Uh, I'm, I'm very against indicators, as like some of you may know here. Um, but you use an, the RSI indicator. An indicator that had that everyone in their mother have access to. If 90% of people are using one indicator, right? And 90% of traders are unprofitable, 
does it make sense to use that indicator? Does it does it make sense to rely on outer data sets that are easily accessible when making your decisions? Probably not. A lot of people use it as a crutch to trade because they don't know how to properly read price action. That's availability heuristics. So how do we combat these biases? Because that's the main thing. It's one thing to recognize them, but then how do we combat them? The first thing, and this is something that has helped me tremendously, is setting daily risk limits on my trades. I know because of my daily risk limits that if I lose two full trades in a row, I'm done for the day. Regardless of if I have another really good opportunity up uh, right after that. I know that I'm not seeing the market correctly and that I need to sideline myself. There's a reason that prop firms, hedge funds, institutional trading firms have risk management departments. People's jobs are literally to make sure people don't blow up because of these psychological biases. They have risk managers. You don't. You have to be your own risk manager. And that's hard. It's hard to do. I tried to unload that duty onto my girlfriend. Uh, I told her, if I lose twice in a row, you got to tell me to stop trading. It didn't really work because I would, you know, I just wouldn't tell her that I lost. But regardless, that's one of the ways that you can kind of start combating this. And it's hard. I get it. It is. And it truly is. The second one, and this one is going to be, might hit home a little bit, is the idea of self-reflection and knowing that you're not you're not the shit. You're not the person, you're not that guy, right? Like no one is coming to save you. No Twitter trader is coming to save you or Instagram guru, whatever it is. You need to shift responsibility from them onto yourself. And isn't that the most appealing thing of the markets? The fact that it's total freedom and that if you do have success in the markets, you know that wasn't inherited. Right? That's not something that you stumbled upon. It's something you work towards and that your success is entirely your own. To me, that's that's freedom. So now let's jump into the last pillar of consistency. Mindset and beliefs. I want you to read that first paragraph. Actually, I'm going to read it so it goes faster. <laughs> um, okay. It is the belief that the market holds infinite possibilities. The opportunities are abundant and within our grasp. That makes all the difference. With this mindset, we approach the market with a sense of calm, knowing that there always is another opportunity around the corner. That's heavy. That's heavy stuff. What you need to do is be able to understand and internalize this. Because once you do, you no longer feel the fear in the markets. You no longer feel greed to actively chase price. You no longer feel fear in the way that you're scared to take a trade because you're gonna lose again. You're no longer overconfident that all if you have a winning streak, you're, you win three in a row that you're gonna be and you're going to win every other trade. When you approach the market with this type of calm and consistency and this mindset, that's when you start executing. That's it. You start executing and you start taking every step necessary to move yourself forward, including being in a state of flow. Have you ever, <laughs> I love this anecdote, have you ever been you know, shooting hoops or something like that? And you're, you're just hitting every shot from the free throw line. Just bang, bang, bang in a row. You can't miss. You start like hook shotting. You start doing some, some wild stuff and everything's just going in. You're in a state of flow. You're in a state of flow. And that's the way you need to be in the market. Not necessarily hitting every shot, but having the confidence and the belief that the next shot is going to go in. You're committing to the infinite possibilities that are in the market and you're committing to your growth on every trade and every step that you take. That's the mindset for consistency. 
So that brings us full circle, okay? The path. I want you to examine this and think about where you are on this journey. Put it in the chat if you want. You can throw it in the chat. Where do you think you are on this you know, three-tiered path? Pro. Stephen's a pro. Good. What are you doing here then if you're a pro? You should be leading this. New, Anthony. I see Rami and, and Haas in here. These guys are pros. New intermediate, lol. Intermediate. Perfect. Timothy, what about you? Where do you think you, you see yourself? Jay's new. It's good that you're willing to admit that. Some people aren't willing to, <laughs> to admit when they're new at something and they're not necessarily good at it yet, right? So the path. There are actions you can take at each step of the path on this journey to move yourself forward. I honestly think that stagnation is death. And of what we've talked about, what are you doing to move yourself further and further down the path on this graph here? What are you move, What are you doing to move yourself from new to intermediate? What are you doing to move yourself from intermediate to pro or from new intermediate to intermediate pro? What are you doing to move yourself forward to your goals? I appreciate everybody for listening. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. We are going to have more streams like this that you can come and learn about things that you are interested in. Like I said, next 48 hours, you have access to a free Q&A. And also, if you have any other questions and you're not quite sure yet, you haven't quite made up your mind, make sure to email support at incomemasteryclub.com and we can definitely help you with you know, deciding what's right for you. What might be right for you, what might, what might not be right for you, depending on where you are in your journey. Okay, thanks guys. I appreciate everybody tuning in.